are joined now by two of my uh, very good friends from down in Charleston. Delegate Elliot, Elliot Pritt. Elliot, can you hear us? Yes, I can, Mike. How are you all this morning? Doing good. Doing well. And Delegate good. Jimmy Willis. Good morning, everybody. They, uh, they both serve on education with me, and I, I wanted to uh, do a... a, a, a a segment on education. Elliot is actually a school teacher, and Jimmy sits on LOSIA, which is the Oversight Committee for Education. So uh, let's just dive right into it, Elliot. Um, school discipline bill that we almost got to the finish line. Um, your thoughts on it, and are we set to bring it back next session? Well, I certainly hope so. Um, I think that was probably one of my biggest personal disappointments uh, from this last session. To see something that was just so important to a lot of teachers in this state die on the last night, um, pretty frustrating. You know, uh, the, we passed a pretty robust discipline bill in 23 session, but that bill only applied to grades 6 through 12. And so what we had hoped to do in the 24 session with this bill that died the last night was extend a lot of those procedures down in similar Excuse form. Can you give a quick overview of what, what yeah. was in that bill uh, for for me yeah so essentially similar procedures to what we passed in 23 giving the teacher authority to define what was disruptive behavior or not now the elementary school bill that came out of the senate and it's sb 641 um was involved law enforcement to some degree as well if the parents didn't show up to pick the kids up that may have been a hang-up for some people but i didn't have an issue with it no, at some point, if you're injuring another student or are that disruptive or your parents don't show up, um, I think law enforcement does have to be involved, correct? Yeah, well, and if, you're, if, you're parent, if a parent is not showing up to pick up a child by the end of the school day and nobody can get a hold of them, I mean, that's neglect on the part of the parent. Um, and, it, you know, so law enforcement should get involved. But, you know... Just the long and short of it is we've got to get it across the line, and I hope that we do this, this next year. So, Jimmy, how do we – what's the relationship or how much have you seen the relationship between discipline problems and test scores within uh, a school system or within the Department of Education? Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's a key and major factor in, in why we're seeing low test scores. I mean, when you got kids who are getting in trouble every day – and, and the only way to discipline them is you just send them in the principal's office for the rest of that class period. Well, then they're not getting the education that they need, and they're not learning the stuff that's going to end up being on those tests. And we need to find a better way to, to make sure that there is punishment for their actions, but also to teach them to, to not be as unruly in the classrooms and find that common, that middle ground between the two. Why? It's almost like an alternative school, right? Yeah, um, I mean, I, why is it the responsibility? Yeah, this is John Gilstrap. Why is it the responsibility of a public school to it's to it's to teach the kids? It, it was to teach all the kids. But if you've got disruptors, and we're talking about a relatively small percentage, I mean, certainly less than twenty, and I hope that's that's a generously high number. If you've got the disruptors, why why do they get to command so much of the classroom time? I agree. It, it gets to a point where. You know, if they're hindering the education of the majority in the classroom, they need to go. And they probably need to go for the rest of the semester at a minimum, probably the rest of the school year. On to public virtual school or some other option, that's what we do in Fayette County because we don't have an alternative school. And a lot of counties in this state don't have alternative schools. And that's a problem. Um, many of us on Ed House Ed had introduced a resolution to study to see you know, what the cost would be to set up alternative schools in each of the counties. And I don't think that resolution made it across the line either. No, I think the uh, the price tag was, was, was held up. I don't think that made it out of committee. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Of course. So and, and it comes back to our Constitution, John. Uh, we Our Constitution says we have to educate every kid in, in the state. And, and I understand exactly what but you're where's, saying. I guess I don't understand. I'm, 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 not, I'm not in Charleston. Uh, but where's the pushback coming from? Surely there's nobody in the state house who is saying, no, we need disorderly classrooms. I am in favor of disorderly classrooms. So if 
which would mean that there's everybody's kind of on the same side of the issue. So where is the pushback? Oh, I think there was major pushback. I think uh, um, Delegate Pushkin stalled that that bill as as much as he could so it couldn't we would have passed that bill um yes. if if he didn't filibuster and they did the Demo democrats didn't hold us up and at, what was his line. argument his, his argument was we we don't need law enforcement he doesn't believe in 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 the style of discipline he, he thinks that it was uh probably too harsh on minorities and uh kids with special needs mm. Is that the feeling you two got? I mean, yes, yeah. yes, uh, yeah. And, and it's it, he also is operating on the idea that not every county is providing a lot of positive supports for students. I mean, in Fayette County, we have communities and schools, social workers, clothing closets, counselors, uh, therapists, and we still have rampant discipline issues. And so, I think this idea that all the kids will just behave and all of society's ills will go away if we provide certain things in the schools is fairy tale. Some counties are already doing that, and it's not working. Yeah, I think there's a lot of people that would that want to address this with with like more counselors, and we need more counselors. And I, you know, my personal opinion is our, our education system is there to educate children. And we're, we shouldn't be in the counseling and, and psychiatric business in the educational realm. That either you are there to learn. Or we're going to remove you from the classroom and educate those who are there to learn because right now this is becoming a, a problem to the extent where teachers are not able to teach all of the classroom because of one or two disruptive students and uh, so nobody learns in these scenarios and I think there was some pushback uh, from the left uh, is to say well where are we going to put them if you take them out of the classroom where do they go um, and I, I'm more concerned with you know if you have a, a classroom of 20 25 and and you remove one disruptive students the other 19 or 24 or whatever it is are still getting educated and and that's the goal here is to make sure that we're educating those who want to be educated elliot do you feel like you are overwhelmed with ieps and um th th those kind of uh paperwork uh, requests as yes. a teacher Yes, and I speak generally because I can't speak yeah. just about specific students and situations. But, I mean, yes, um, I think what's happening is we're having kids with behavior issues. And as a cover, you know, CYA kind of thing for the school boards, they're putting these kids on behavior plans or IEPs and labeling them as, you know, special needs or special education students that need supports. But once that happens federal law kicks in and those kids have certain protections and we're not no longer able to discipline them like we do i guess quote unquote regular students and so and i think it's fair to also point out i think that there was a ton of pushback from the state department of education yes on our discipline bills too it wasn't just the democrats in the house it was also the institutional the institution itself so you know so jimmy you sit on Lucia. What kind of oversight do you truly have? I mean, it's the Legislative Oversight Committee on Education. What kind of oversight do you have when, when, when the State Department or, or the uh, institution comes to you and says, we're implementing these rules, these are what we're doing, this is what we're doing to improve test scores? What, what kind of teeth do you actually have? Well, I mean, as you guys both know, um, it's pretty interesting with, um, with the way the Department of Education is set up in the state of West Virginia where they do have have that certain level of autonomy from the legislature so other than really hitting them with questions and getting it out in the public um it, it is tough to really truly have oversight over them like some of the other oversight committees do and um it's something that obviously i was hoping that that uh amendment would pass back in 22 and we could get some more oversight over them but it, it does severely limit the amount of oversight we have over the the department Elliot, your, your feeling uh, from other teachers that you talked to, why was Amendment uh, 2, I think it was Amendment 2, right? Uh, why was it so unpopular um, throughout the state? I four. think because it was lumped four. in with yeah. all the other ones and it was a victim of its friends, I guess you could say. Um, I think also, to the narrative that increasing government's power, I think, was used to argue against it. 
Um, and I think that was probably pretty effective. I don't know that it was an honest argument, but it was an effective one. Those two things are often not the same. Right. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, uh, but also too, I mean, to Jimmy's point, I think it, it, a lot of it depends on the executive branch as well. They make a lot of appointments, uh, as far as like individuals that are controlling these decisions. So maybe a new leaf will turn in January. And I will say this for our listening audience, our, our, our watchers, we are actively working on a school aid formula um, revamp, if you will. Um, we don't pretend to have all the answers, but we are delving. That's one of our, our, our interim committee um, asks was to go to our school boards, go to our, our things and find the answers to the school aid formula. Is there any data that shows because what... I look at it this. I, I haven't had a school age kid in quite some time. But if I did and I had moved to, to West Virginia, he would be going to private school. And if, if I was not of significant means, I would find a way to pay for the private school. And do we find that the is is that happening a lot are people no are, i, I are, think our our schools are actually if and I, I speak for myself both my kids are in public school and they both do very well on all their tests and they are straight a students but i think it comes back to there there are a majority of kids that just don't care about these tests there are a small minority of kids that are just don't have any um six percent are performing at yeah. grade level. That's well, yeah. that's ninety four percent of the kids not caring. Yeah, yeah, go ahead, Emmett. Yeah. So as far as the testing goes, I think it's fair to point out as an educator, I mean we most people and I've said it before, are busting their rear ends to do their job the right way. And you know, if a kid decides to fly through computer the standardized testing in five minutes and then put their head down for the rest of the testing period, there's nothing we can do about that. And it's a lot of them. Are you allowed as a teacher to add that as part of the grade? Into the rest. What is it? Are you allowed as a teacher to say, hey, this is going to be 20% of your grade? Is, is there no. any autonomy as a teacher to say this is important to, to the class? No. When it comes to standardized testing, no. And also students that are on IEPs, their scores are not curved or weighted differently. They're thrown into the entire average. And so, you know... And, and everybody's tested, correct? Yeah, everybody's are averaged together, no matter whether they took five minutes or they have a very low intellectual capability. They're all averaged together, and that's not something you see in private schools. Because and private if, if schools, I could, yeah, yeah. If I if I could add into being being so young, I mean, I was in high school just six years ago, and one thing I saw with some of the testing, these standardized tests, not affecting your final grade, is you have kids who are. They're not going to college. They're not going to technical schools. They're going straight to the workforce. So those, those were the kids who, they're, they, I mean, they didn't care. You know, it, it wasn't going to affect them in the long run. And they were able to just um, to just rush through the test and then take that nap for the rest of the class period or the rest of the testing period, and it didn't, didn't affect them one bit. So tell me, tell me which states are doing this right, and how are they doing it different, and how should we emulate them to get a true picture of whether or not we're educating our, our children to the, the standard that we should be? I, I think I one of the ones an I look to, yep. yeah, I think one of the ones I look to, I can't say if they're doing it right or not, but I look to Florida a lot with some of the legislation they've passed in the few, last few years. I'm not necessarily saying they do it right, but I'm interested to see the results of of what happens with that legislation, uh, opening it up a little bit more to the parents and stuff like that. And I think one of the things that I'm most excited for being on Locia in a couple years is to see what our fourth graders what our fourth graders look like when they've had uh, all the years of having the Third Grade Success Act and having the ECAP positions in the first, second, and third grade classrooms to see if that is going to cause some improvement here in the state of west virginia but are other states testing everybody are they testing the iep uh children are they testing those who aren't going to college um and so i would think that their kids in other states do the same thing they rush through the test they put their head down just like they do here in west virginia so is there something that the other states are doing to say hey we're not going to test those kids we're only going to test these and and therefore get a different result or or are the test 
um, equal across uh, the whole nation? Um, <clears throat> that I'm not too sure of, of how other ta other states do it on a, if they do it on a curve or not. Um, one of the things I know that we've we've talked about in education is the whole just the idea of you learn for a year, then at the end of the year you take this big big standardized test and looking to move towards more of a throughout the year multiple smaller tests just to see your improvement and just do benchmark testing as well and I think that's something that we could really see if we did it that way we could really see where where we're struggling in teaching our kids when you have more targeted towards certain parts of the curriculum and is there is there some move to make these tests um important to the student to make it a part of their grade is there any any move to do that i mean aside from giving a pep talk you know i don't know that we're allowed to tie standardized testing to their grade and i think another another thing that people don't realize and people don't consider in this situation is we don't test kids cohort we don't test their scores by cohort we test grade to grade and so one year one group I may have kids that perform very well, and then they move on to the next grade. And then I'll have another group come in and maybe have a lot of IEPs this year or have discipline issues. It's a totally different group of kids. They do worse on the test. Then it looks like our test scores have gone down, even though it's a totally different group of kids. It's not the same kids. So we're not testing co by cohort. We're testing by grade. And I think that in and of itself is an issue. Elliot, do we... Uh is our teaching that you teach uh, sixth grade, correct? I teach seventh and eighth seventh, grade. Seventh and eighth. So is that test applicable to what you are teaching? Do you get to look at, do you get to see these tests? So the test scores are generally shared with us so we can kind of see what's No, the actual more. test. Do you get to do it? Yeah. So, no, yeah, I can administer the test, but I teach social studies. Okay. And social study history is not a part of... Of, of the testing, standardized okay. testing, but I do help and am required to assist with English learning, so essay structure, grammar, spelling, things like that. I, and I do that in my classroom to kind of help the English teacher prepare our kids for testing. Do you think? Do you think English in general, because of technology and the way? Um, we're, kids are on iPads before they can they can write. Uh, do you think that yeah. is having an effect on English? Like we don't teach cursive anymore. We're not really writing essays. We're typing everything. Is that affecting some of our um, standards? Yes, yes. And all peer-reviewed research about electronic devices and, and the development of a child's brain, all of it says do not give young children electronic devices. And what does the school system do? gives all of them electronic devices peer-reviewed research pretty much all of it says title one funding is not working what do all the schools do double down on title one funding it's like a it's like a monolith that cannot be touched or talked about and so i think that's why you know your idea of examining the school aid formula school funding formula i think it's important yeah. because we spend a lot on education in this state to get very poor outcomes and i think that a lot of that money we're spending is getting soaked up by redundant and unnecessary administrative things administration and it needs to filter down to the classroom and so how do we move that money or reduce administrative funding to help increase teaching salaries that's what i'd like to see but when we talk about these test scores gentlemen we're not talking about uh, minor variances um, 28 in, throughout across West Virginia 28 percent of eighth graders perform at at grade level for math and 43 percent perform at grade level for ELA which is I guess the English language and, and, and whatever I mean that's those are those are abysmal numbers we could we could add 50 percent to that and they're still bad numbers so you yeah. know that's that's not that's not a test score it, issue. And the issue is you look at the test scores and you look at our graduation rates and you look at the grades, there is a, there's a fundamental flaw between the test score and the grade, and, and, and we haven't figured out what that is yet. Well, I know, but I, I just, and I'm not, understand, I'm not trying to yeah. put anybody on the spot here. I'm expressing frustration. But when I, when I hear the discussion comes down to the kids don't care about the test scores, and okay, fine. But this is, this is, 
really abysmal scoring. And I have to yeah. assume that if kids don't care about the scores here, they don't care about the same number of kids don't care about the scores in all the other 50 states. Sure. So that should be kind of a constant. And we're still well, not we, there. We I still very much are. Can, go ahead. Go ahead, Jimmy. Yeah. What, what I could say is, too, again, being, being in, the, in, the, in the public school system as a student so recently, is sometimes I think it gets, people get a little too caught up on making sure those test scores are good, so they're not necessarily teaching you the science behind English or math and stuff like that. They're just teaching you how to pass it on a test. There were many things, especially in math, that I knew how to do simply to make sure I got a test question right that to do now probably wouldn't be able to do. And I think we got to focus more, and I think Delegate Sattler did some legislation on this and is probably going to do some more, on getting back to lear really learning the science of reading and the science of math and not just learning it so that we can get a question right on a test score at the end of the year. You know, Elliot, you, yeah. you brought up a, a great issue earlier when you talked about funding and, and the federal mm -hmm. funding that we get for schools and um, how how that affects the state and, and what we mandate throughout the state. It will be interesting to see. I know here recently that Tennessee has, uh, has stopped taking all federal funds for education. Um, they, they, they're at the state level, or enough, at the that they board don't of have to level. take right. They don't have yeah. to take it anymore. They've they've uh, they've said we're we're no longer going to take any federal funds, and they have completely reformed their education system in Tennessee because of it, because they're not mandated to do all these things anymore. And it'll be interesting to see where they are in in the next five to ten years uh, in in education, uh, and whether or not they they start moving up or whether it affects them negatively. I, I think. It It'll, it'll uh, affect them positively. I think you'll start seeing a, a difference in the state of Tennessee. I don't know that we can afford to do that in the state of West Virginia. Um, we, we need those funds, unfortunately, but uh, it'll be interesting to see how that they're affected. So, yeah. gentlemen, I'm hearing rumors of legislation um, coming up that would uh, remove cell phones, cell phones from classrooms or uh, the, the class setting. Elliot, I'd like to your thoughts. We've got about a minute left. I'd like to hear both of you on your thoughts, 30 seconds each. Yeah, it, it encourages bullying. Most of the bullying that takes place is, is through that cell phones, and it's a distraction. And so I would support it. Jimmy? Um, yeah, I think it's going to be interesting. I want to see how the bill is written, and it'll be very interesting. What I can add, too, is up here, one of my counties I represent, Ohio County, is actually moving forward with doing this on their own at, at, at least the high school. And I'm going to be looking to see how it works in that first semester before we get down to Charleston to have some real, real data to, to help report to the legislature on the issue. Gentlemen, I want to thank you uh, for your time. I know it, it goes fun. I look forward to seeing you both, uh, whether you're at the Greenbrier or whether we, we see you at interims in, uh, in August. Um, I will see you on a Zoom call soon. Thank you, guys. Appreciate your time today. Thank you. Thank you. Take care, thank gentlemen. You. Thank you. Thank you, guys.